Welcome everyone. My name is Erin Meyer. I am the Sustainable Food Programs Coordinator at UC Merced. Uh, we are here today to talk about compost, uh, soil, and all of those fun things. Um, I wanted to give it over to Guillermo to introduce himself as well, and then we can get into uh, the other panelists. Guillermo, what's up? Hi, Erin. How are you doing? Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Guillermo Ortiz. I'm the Sustainability and Diversity Educational Programs Manager here at UC Merced. I want to thank uh, our panelists for joining us today and for everyone hopping on the call as well. Looking forward to the discussion. And with that, uh, I'll turn it over to the panelists. And so the first one on my uh, computer screen right now is Martin. Martin, would you like to unmute yourself and introduce yourself? There I am. OK. Uh, my name is Martin Hildebrandt. I'm the uh, technician for the Sustainable Ag Laboratory Garden Mini Farm at uh, California State University Stanislaus. And uh, oh, I also um, I teach community composting in the city of Modesto. Awesome. Thank you. Dan, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm uh, Dan Haifman. I'm actually in Sunnyvale, California. Uh, I'm a master composter in the UCCE uh, Santa Clara County program. And I've been a master composter since 2004. And I focus on teaching workshops, compost workshops to the community in the North Santa Clara County area, primarily Sunnyvale, but some in Palo Alto and Mountain View too and Cupertino. Um, I'm also a gardener. And in fact, that's what has driven my compost operation for many years is actually soil health and gardening. So I look forward to the discussion today. Um, thank you for joining us. Jacob, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Jacob Nestledge. I'm a uh, graduate student with the Environmental Systems Graduate Group at UC Merced. My area of uh, expertise is spatial ecology, so not necessarily composting, uh, but I am also an environmental engineer. And so my interest in composting has come through from basically being involved in uh, community gardening and trying to manage composting for the 18th Street People's Garden. And that's in Merced. Thank you. All right, Alasia, welcome. Hello. Um, so my name is Alasia Wheatley. I am the zero waste coordinator for UC Merced. Um, I also work in our campus garden on campus, where we compost as well. Um, but I also run and manage the compost operations we have on the university level. Awesome. Thank you. And then Rebecca, welcome. We're just doing some intros. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, and apologize for arriving a few minutes late. I had a, a talk right before this one. Thankfully, I just had to skip from Zoom rooms and not walk across buildings, but I, I do apologize for um, coming a minute early. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. I love talking compost. Um, I am faculty at UC Merced um, in the Department of Life and Environmental Sciences. Um, I teach classes in agroecology and I do research. Um, a lot of my research looks at the use, uh, the capture, transformation and reuse of wasted organic materials. Um, so a lot of the research that I look at and study uh, uh, looks at um, the use of compost um, as a climate solution, um, quantifying impacts on soil carbon storage, reduced greenhouse gas emissions, and a number of other co-benefits that come with that. Um, and also look at uh, composting human feces if anybody's interested in that as well. Thanks, Erin. Of course. All right, so to get started, we can do a mix of things. I've got some questions that came in via the registration um, and then I have my own questions, but it's also a lot of fun to hear from you all. Like, what do you want to know about compost? What do you wanna learn? Um, what do you wanna engage with? So feel free and, um, oh, it looks like Jacob's gonna be rejoining us. All right, um, so thank you, Alicia, for putting that in the chat. Um, 
now. So if anyone has any questions, they can unmute if you would like, or you can also put it directly in the chat. Um, and then I'll just leave a minute for anyone that has questions. All right, I can get us started. Um, what does composting have to do with climate change? And that's a question for anyone, whoever wants to unmute. I'd be happy to take that question from the science side of things. Um, we study uh, climate change solutions. And so um, uh, if we could go back to soils rather than just compost, but soil is a really, really important climate solution. Um, the soil holds more carbon than all of the carbon in the atmosphere and plants combined. It's a really important reservoir of soil. We manage it um, in good ways and bad ways. So uh, we've actually lost a lot of carbon from our soils. Um, and so compost is one uh, of a suite of carbon farming practices that can very quickly and effectively restore carbon pools in the soil and help to kind of revitalize the ability of, our, uh, of nature to capture more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So we call that a drawdown solution because by applying compost to a soil system, you increase the capacity of plants to photosynthesize, pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and put it into soils and vegetation. Um, and composting also from a life cycle perspective, um, uh, tends to be a net um, greenhouse gas reduction strategy. And it's a practice that's approved by the California um, Healthy Soils Initiative. So farmers and ranchers now can get financial incentives for applying compost to their fields. There's also a new um, practice from the USDA that farmers can tap into their uh, uh, assistance funds for, for doing that as well. So there's both kind of a scientific merit for compost as a climate strategy and also new policies and financial incentives for supporting it. Awesome, thank you. Um, so can you define or explain life cycle analysis for us? Um, sure, life cycle analysis is one tool that we use when we're trying to answer big questions like this because we know that our systems are all connected. And so if we're trying to think of a climate solution um, uh, that we're doing on a field, so on a, you know, if we're thinking about compost application to a farm, we can quantify what, does, what it does at that farm level, but there's things happening outside of that farm level that are associated with that practice, the production, the transportation of that compost, uh, alternative uses of that compost if it's going to landfills um, or if it's used in some other way. So a life cycle assessment is one tool that uh, that defines the boundary at which you're quantifying the impacts of a particular practice. Um, and it's really important, especially when we're thinking about the climate, because you don't want to do one practice that makes reduction in one place, but then also makes an increase in gas emissions in another place. Thank you. All right, so one person in the chat uh, wants to know more about this poop business that you mentioned. I don't wanna hog the microphone. So if anybody else likes to talk poop, please chime in as well. Um, but I'm, um, you know, there's about um, uh, four, four pedograms uh, of animal and human feces that are generated every year. I often think about our poop as a renewable resource. When it's managed in unhealthy ways, it creates all sorts of public health problems and environmental health problems. Um, and, uh, you know, we likely most of us live in places that have a flushing toilet and it's connected to a sewer system or a septic system, but actually much of the world doesn't. And so um, I'm working with an organization in Haiti that's uh, using ecological sanitation, basically using compost as a way to sanitize human waste. Um, and then also produce um, this amazing soil resource that can be used for crop production. So we, we call that closing the poop loop. Um, that's one location that it's done, but actually there's people doing this all over the world, including, uh, including in, the, in the US. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, there is a question in general, just a big question about SB 1383 and our community. 
Would anyone like to tackle that? Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, so Dean Mir mentioned, uh, my big question is SB 1383 and our community, and I believe she's in Merced. Um, and so I guess the question would be, what is SB 1383? What does it mean for our community? It would also be really interesting to know what it means for you, Dan, and um, Sunnyvale, uh, because I know that each county has kind of a different uh, progress on this matter. Um, some people are more ahead of us. We're very behind, I think. Uh, so does anyone want to address that? From what they know, anyway? I can address it a little bit for Sunnyvale. Uh, we've had actually a food scrap composting program in the city now for probably five years, four or five years. Uh, and it's, it's being perfected every year. However, it itself has a pretty good carbon footprint. You know, the food is really heavy and they got to haul that food to a, the facility where they actually process it. Sunnyvale is doing two things. One, they process the material into animal feed for non-meat eating animals, like especially pigs and birds. Um, but they're learning that they can process it and uh, that same front end process can be actually directly put into the sewage treatment system without excessive amount of water like you would use if you were to run it through your garbage disposal. And they, they, they do methane capture. So they're actually making sin fuels out of food scrap composting. But this new law was passed, I think a few years ago and it, this is the first year of implementation that's required statewide. Now, many, like I said, many of the communities in the Bay Area, and I think it was all led by San Francisco, have been working on this for quite some time. But for many communities, it's a brand new thing. Now, in the home composting world, we strongly encourage people to process their own non-meat food scraps in their home composting system. And of course, verma composting, where you use worms in a sealed box is the best way to process those food scraps. And basically has, no, has zero carbon footprint of its own because there's no machinery involved, no trucks having to transport that heavy stuff out to a site. I'd like to oh, thank you. Um... So for those that possibly don't know, um, SB 1383 was, it's a common cycle re uh, regulation that now requires jurisdictions to compost and not just residents, but businesses, um, solid food waste facilities, food banks, it just requires everyone to compost. Um, it went into effect January 1st, 2022, and a lot of people are behind. Um, and did not prepare for it. You see Merced and Merced County being one of them. This is something that we are working on to get us to be compliant. There are different tiers um, when it comes to compliance, um, but for universities and the tier that like, people that fall within that tier, the biggest thing is making sure that we are either composting our food um, or there's a second part of the uh, SB 1383 that says if you have edible food that it needs to be recovered and either donated to a food bank or made into animal feed, um, it just can't go into the landfill, which is really great because food shouldn't be going into the landfill. We should be putting it into compost where it isn't going to produce methane, isn't going to, um, especially if the food is edible, there's a lot of people that would benefit from it. Um, and so you should, you'll be hearing a lot more about SB 1383, because once again, it did go into effect January. Um, and so it's definitely something that's going to be on the horizon for everyone. Asia, can I ask you a follow-up question about that? Um, 
can you tell us a little bit more about what UC Merced is doing to meet those uh, goals, either through procurement or composting? Like, are we do gonna be doing composting on campus, for example? And then also, if you know anything about what's going on in the community, because I saw like one red food bin and I like, <laughs> Get excited for about it, but it's just used for call of like garbage. So I'm seeing like I, I'm just I've been wondering what's going on at the county level, and and as you know, UC Merced um, it can be a real leader in this. So I'm wondering about the great work that you're doing. If you could tell us a little bit more about that, thank you. Um, so we do currently compost on campus, just not all of campus. So upper campus, which is anything past anything past the lake in that little bridge that's called upper campus compost um we and then all of the big bellies so those are the solar compactors that are just everywhere on campus all of that compost goes to the um back of back of house that is composted um we work with modesto's compost sadly because there is no co composting uh facility close that's the closest one um, that will accept the amount of compost that school uh, produces. For lower campus, we're actually within the next couple of weeks, we'll be implementing compost in the dining facility. Um, currently at our dining facility, we only have a landfill and recycling compactor, and we will be adding a landfill roll-off and making the landfill comp a compactor into a compost compactor. And so now dining will be able to compost. Um, and our next biggest feat is getting the recycle, getting the housing um, places on campus to have compost as, as an option. It's a little bit difficult and it's gonna require a lot of uh, education to the students um, to change their human behavior and um, educate them on what compost is. I think that's something that we don't Acknowledge and something I noticed as a student being uh, part of the eco reps and um, a part of council. One of the things I always used to do for Bobcat Day was we did uh, a game called Trash Get Ball, where you hand uh, people just random items and ask them to put them in the right bin. And people never really knew what the green bin was. They'd be like, I don't know what goes in there. And so I think it's gonna it's gonna require a lot of education and constant education because there's always gonna be new students, always gonna be more new staff and faculty. Um, so that's for UC Merced. For Merced County, I know we did start an SP 1383 group, but I'm not sure what happened with that here. Yeah, I can provide a brief update on my end. Um, so I'm the Sustainable Food Programs Coordinator and I work with Alasia. Um, with on-campus stuff, but also I work a lot out in the community. And we have one program called the Bobcat Eats Food Waste Awareness and Prevention Program, which is um, a food rescue program that is pretty much that edible food recovery operator. Um, and so we've been doing a lot of legwork with the county to try and figure out where they are on that um, in terms of implementation, because I have a feeling that once businesses have to start like complying with this, um, we will get busier because they will be asking hopefully for more food recovery pickups. Um, because that would be ideal. No offense to the composters out here, but it's better to rescue that food than to compost it, right? If it's edible, let's have people eat it. Um, and so we would like to pick up this edible food from folks. What I've been hearing from the county is that they have begun a, bl a plan. Um, they have timelines in place and everything, um, but they haven't really started doing the outreach yet. I believe that will be in the near future. Um, and the same is to be said on your home composting and so on. Um, so I would just look at the news stay tuned for that maybe follow up with me in a month or so um there are some laws also out there that are um, allowing counties that are not prepared to have kind of an extension and so i believe that's where we're falling is that we have an extension um and i hope that helps address some of it and then part of my thing is like 
I don't know why we need an extension for this. Let's just start saving this food already. Um, so if anyone has a local business in Merced, we are happy to help pick up that edible food and then just stay tuned um, to the news. And if you follow us on like Food Connect, Food Connect 2020 on both Twitter and Facebook, I post a lot of stuff on there regarding sustainable food systems. And um, whenever we get the news, that'll probably be on there um, and we'll just keep you updated. All right, any other questions? If anyone wants to unmute. Uh, this is Martin here at the head of the line. Um, just thinking about this, because I've seen a lot of this go by over the years. Um, none of this is really new. The, um, you know, starting back in the 80s, when there was 70s, actually, when there was the massive garbage trains moving across the United States and ships offshore in New York, and it was really part of the original um, environmental movement. There were laws put down that the uh, the um, shippers, haulers, and responsible parties of waste had to reduce the waste going into the dumps. And uh, one of the first things that was done was try and um, pull the green waste out of the waste stream um, because that was the lowest hanging fruit. Now that is in fact why the city of Modesto has a composting facility because something like 70% of all of their solid waste was green waste. And so they set up a composting facility and the state still mandates that cities um, uh, and, um, and service providers like a Recology and people like that um, uh, put, put on um, public education. That's probably what Dan, that's what Dan would be involved in. Um, he's providing, and I do too, public education. And I'm actually paid through City of Modesto to put on little composting classes. That's been going on for more than 25 years. Um, what's new is the previous mandates reflected overall waste being generated and compost as being the low hanging fruit. Now, the new, and those mandates ratcheted up every few years. They would get, you'd have to have less, a higher and higher percentage of what your, your waste would have to go um, be recycled or something like that. And, a lot of times it was postponed by politics. The last big move was about 15 years ago when there was, if any of you were there, there was a big shakeup in the garbage industry. Um, and the reason there was is because the garbage industries were mandated for another 10, 15% increase in recyclables. And so a lot of them, like ecology, went around and bought up all their competitors. Um, they had to compost, so they just bought up composting facilities and put it in their name instead of somebody else's name, and um, and that that works. <laughs> um, but now the mandate is not just reducing the waste, but specifically composting itself, and so that's a little bit different than what it was before. So instead of the 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 uh, responsible parties choosing what the recyclable item is, it's focused on composting and, and it's reuse and things like that, which is all a very good thing. So there's some background for you. That's why, that's why some municipalities already have composting sites. That's why some people already know how to do this. That's why some of People just shrug their shoulders and say, we're there already, we're doing okay. And other people are just like, ah, <laughs> where have we been? So there's some history for you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as you were talking, Martin, you all, you and Dan, you offer community education and everything. And Alasia is trying to figure out how we can educate our community, specifically our UC students. 
So do you have any advice for Alasia on how we can better educate the UC students on composting? I, I have some things I could share on that. You know, one thing I've seen in our workshops, young people especially, they're really concerned about the climate and what's happening. And it's frustrating if there's nothing you can do. And so I think in a university environment like that, if you had a group of volunteers regularly putting on compost workshops and allowing these people to do their composting work, once they take the workshop and you say, yeah, I wanna compost my own waste. Maybe I wanna get a worm bin and put my food scraps in the worm bin and turn out wonderful worm castings. You know, you could set up an area in, in a community garden where people could keep their worm bins and they could take their scraps down there and compost their own food scraps. And by doing this, that and those food scraps can go back into the garden and into their gardens. And that would, uh, just one sec. Uh, thanks, my phone started ringing. Um, they could compost their own food scraps and those that the castings could be used to feed the community garden and the plants in the community garden. And now these students are feeling a part of the solution as opposed to sitting there in fr with frustration about how little is being done to solve this problem. Just some thoughts of my own. And can I just quickly add as a, as a professor, yeah, like sh showing students solutions, there's so many things that are that are frustrating to learn about when you're in the environmental sciences or you're in uh, thinking about environmental justice. And so oftentimes that translates into hopelessness. And so, yeah, I do think that composting is a one is one way that brings community together and also is just a really lovely solution for a lot of wicked problems. So thanks for that. One thing I would say, maybe Alasia, I'll pitch this over to you since you're in the Office of Sustainability. I think relying on volunteers it's good for people like me who have a stable income, but asking our students to contribute all that time, I think that it's to the extent that we can, the university should be responsible to trying to find sources of funds to support those students who can keep a program like that going consistently. Um, maybe just a point for Alasia, I know you don't have a big budget at the Office of Sustainability, but that's one office that can push back to, you know, campus leadership to say, hey, this is important and it has these educational outcomes and it helps us meet SB 1383 and it builds community and, and so on. Martin here. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, it, it's kind of, I'm kind of an interesting, position because I'm the technician for the school here and I do compost uh, from our own facility. I compost some of the uh, uh, street waste that comes off the campus streets and that type of thing. Um, we are not teaching compost as such here at the campus now and I appreciate Dan's um, comment because it makes me say, oh, man, maybe I need to be doing that. But um, there's a lot of there's a lot of things out there that that um, people need to be aware of, and they start with standards. Um, for example, the facility that I'm in charge of is a registered agricultural site. It is not simply a community garden or a, a school garden. Uh, I actually have to have a, uh, a QAC to apply some of the fairly soft pesticides that we would use on site. Um, it's registered with the county, um, overseen by county agents. Um, compost, unless the compost that I make um, is tested and, uh, and approved to be used on food crops, I can't use it on food crops um, for uh, at least two years uh, after it's made, in which case, if you know anything about compost, it's two years old, it's not worth very much. Um, and um, 
the uh, these standards are the type of standards that you know anytime you elevate a effort above just a very grassroots effort, uh, you're going to run into these standards. Um, recycling uh, food, food that's already been in the food chain, and oh, we're going to recycle that back into the food chain. Oh, I don't think you're going to do that because standards are going to get in your way. How are you going to make sure that food is safe? How are you going to, um, uh, who's going to be the responsible party for that? Um, you know, here at my site, um, there's no way that I would allow anybody to bring any compostable material onto the site they wanted to. Can't do that. Can't speak for it. I'm not responsible for what's coming in. Um, and so those type of things, it's like um, Rebecca and, and her night soil. Um, these standards, and, and Rebecca is very familiar with them, I'm quite sure, and bacterial tests and everything else, um, are, are critical to a healthy society. Um, and I think it's a testimony to composting that if you research the, the history of modern composting, it started with the effort to recycle human waste by Sir Albert Howard, right, over in India. and. Um, the, uh, he was looking for a way that he could render human waste safe um, and decide that composting was a way that it could be done. But he didn't do it without standards. He was testing constantly. He was, you know, um, we have to be aware of that. You just can't throw anything out there. Um, our campus has, uh, a reflecting pond and several other things. These are our, our drainage ponds for the, the campus. They take the drain water off the streets during the winter time. I cannot use those to water my vegetables with the water that comes out of the recycled facility. It doesn't meet standards because uh, the ponds are full of geese and ducks and fish and things that poop. <laughs> and um, the, uh, the E. coli and, and the the amount of heavy metals that come off the street and stuff like that, it, it's not, you know, it, it cannot meet standards. So, um, and it, Dan says, and he's absolutely spot on, the absolutely best place to do this is at your own home, under your own responsibility, because if you put it in there and you eat it, it's your, it's, your, it's first of all your responsibility, but you're not likely to make yourself sick from something that you were already eating. <laughs> uh, whereas if it goes out into the larger community, now, you know, things are different. It's like I, I tell the students all the time. In fact, my helper and I were washing citrus this morning. And I was sorting out a lot of them because we were shipping them. We we're going to sell them to a store. And I said, you know, here's a nice citrus. It's got a black spot on it. So she says, what should I do with this? And I say, throw it in a waste pile. You know, waste pile, we were going to take home and maybe juice some of it. And she kind of looks at it. And I say, would you buy that in the store if you went in the store to buy it? And she said, no. And I said, well, that goes in the other pile. Um, it's, uh, it's like I have a nectarine tree at my house. And there's a blue jay that likes to eat my nectarines. So I'll go out there in the morning to pick a nectarine and it'll have a bird hole in it. So that uh, tells me two things, that nectarine is ripe. And, uh, and I, I really need to get rid of that blue jay. But I'll take the nectarine home and I'll cut out the bird peck and I'll eat it. But I'll dare any of you to go to a grocery store and buy a nectarine with a bird peck in it. Nobody will do it. Okay. Um, so this is the reality that you have to work with a little bit. You, you have to, uh, uh, and, you know, there, there's awareness and training, um, but there's a great deal of pushback from the standards people and the risk management people 
against recycling and what can be recycled and things like this. Uh, each one trying to preserve a line of thought. So I'll end my commentary. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Oh, I would, I would like to add a comment um, on a couple of things that uh, Martin said. One thing is in our workshops, in, in fact, in the county, the program specifically states we do not compost manures from any animal that's naturally meat eating because of pathogens. That includes cats, dogs, and obviously human manures also. And increasingly, composters don't even want to deal with horse manure because of the medicines that's in those manures. However, you got chickens at home, you got pets at home, you know what you're feeding them as long as they're not meat eating animals. Cats and dogs don't count, but Things like uh, chickens and rabbits, you know, the, and their manures are great. Um, so, and then we also tell, teach, you can't compost meat itself in our workshops. And there again, the primary reason for that is pathogens and also pests. But there was a question that showed up in the chat about citrus. In a backyard compost pile, citrus is wonderful. There's a bad rumor going around that never compost citrus. It started because of worm bins. In a worm bin, you do not want to put citrus in because citrus, citric acid is toxic to the worms and they know it and they'll leave it alone and it'll go anaerobic and start stinking. Um, but in a backyard pile with yard waste and stuff like that, citrus is wonderful. So I just wanted to comment on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so getting into backyard composting and everything, at the 18th Street People's Garden, we have some composting going on. Um, and I was hoping that Jacob could kind of explain what we're doing at the Yellow House. That's what we call it, at this community garden. Um, it's very aptly named. It's a bright yellow. Uh, if you want to describe what we're doing and then maybe share how that could be kind of downscaled a little bit for just the average uh, citizen to do backyard composting as well. Yeah, I can share some of that. So I kind of got involved in this in this whole composting thing uh, because there was interest within the community, I think, to take the food scraps that were coming from the 18th Street People's Garden and from some of the food distributions uh, and, and, you know, convert this into compost. But I think there was maybe a lack of uh, maybe like work to try to make that happen. And so what ended up happening is we had two to 300 pounds of compost that was in a pile, uh, basically mini landfill is what we had. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I got involved with this and, and we had to, a, a nice donation of uh, several compost tumblers, uh, about 100 gallons each. Uh, and so we were able to take some of that food waste and, and start uh, tumbling and gain some air in it, you know, trying to, you know, take, take these horrible anaerobic conditions that are full of, you know, hydrogen sulfides and methane, and just the nastiest things you can think of and really try to convert this into usable uh, compost and so this is this is kind of what we're working on right now is using these these tumblers uh, to to deal with the the food waste that's coming from uh, just this community garden as well as some of the food distributions. So far, it's been really effective, but there is some learning curves to this as well as you know if you throw a bunch of stone fruit into your compost, well then you have you know thousands of pits in your compost or <laughs> you know. Um, you know, some, some folks have thrown like sticks <laughs> in the compost that are going to take like 20 years to degrade or something. So um, there's a lot of learning that comes with this community aspect as well. Awesome, thank you. There's a question specific to vermicomposting um, pertaining to worms, of course. Is that correct? Um, so I'll read the whole thing. Um, 
So we do vermicomposting at home and keep the bin in our home because our understanding is that it's too hot here in the summer for the worms to live outside. Is that correct? Or could they um, make it say in a shady spot? I think that is a major barrier to folks doing home composting. When we tell people we do it in the house, they're usually pretty surprised and disgusted, unfortunately. Um, any vermicomposters that wanna jump in on that? Oh, I'll jump in on it first. Um, in our climate, you know, we get temperatures over 100 degrees quite often, but not as hot as you get in the valley in Merced and Modesto area. But it should be fine if you have a wood bin, make a wood box as opposed to a plastic box and keep it under a shade tree. Uh, the wood breathes where a plastic, plastic doesn't and also plastic tends to collect solar energy. The temperature inside the plastic bin can actually be hotter than it is outside, especially if it's in the sun. Uh, but I don't, unless you're getting temperatures, you know, 120 degrees, which who knows with climate change, maybe you're going to be getting those out in the valley more often. Um, you should be able to do it under a shade tree. And if it gets really, really hot, you know, spray the wood bin, spray some water on it in the morning and let it evaporate. That'll help keep it cool throughout the day. Also, you, a worm bin has a quite a bit of volume of material in it. So it takes a while for that material to heat up. And the same thing in the winter, it takes quite a while for it to cool down. So, you know, if you're getting a couple hours of really hot weather a day, it's not gonna have much of an impact. If it's, you know, over a hundred degrees day and night for a week, you're probably gonna to have to take some action to try to keep it from overheating. I don't have experience with that because we haven't, we don't have those kinds of temperatures here. However, I still believe if you wet it down, you have a wood bin and you put it under a shade tree, you'll be just fine. May I? pop in there a little bit. I'm sorry. Um, Dan, thank you. A um, couple points that you made, but you didn't emphasize the size of the bin. Um, I, I had some students who did a worm project in five gallon cans. They all died because they got too hot, even though I tried to keep them in, in a, uh, a shaded area. Um, but a, a fairly large volume. And I'm guessing that your wood bin has access to the dirt underneath it rather than freestanding above the dirt. Is that right, Dan? Um, we, if you put the bin on top of a couple two by fours, so that moisture that in the bin can drain out from under it, you got holes, you poke holes in underneath the bin, a few holes, and you don't have to worry about the worms crawling out because they don't want to. If they got a nice home there, they don't want to crawl out. So um, that'll keep a little moisture from draining. But other than that, yeah, it's just like a couple inches off the top of the soil. If it's on soil, if it's on concrete, we recommend putting something like an oil drain pan or something under it so you don't permanently stain the concrete with the liquid that drains out. Did that answer the question, Mark? Yeah, it did. It, it, um, I was imagining it to been like a compost pile would have contact with the soil and you've made it clear that it doesn't. Um, but, uh, but that's fine. Yeah. And, uh, but having it close to the ground will keep it cooler than having it, let's say table height or something like that. Um, and also a, a reasonable volume. What would you say would be a, a good volume for an outdoor stand, um, worm bin? Obviously my experience of five gallon can won't work. <laughs> Yeah, the problem with the five gallon cans, you don't have a lot of surface area. You just have a lot of depth. And in planting a worm bin, think two dimensional because the worms spend almost all their time in the food. That's why they're called litter worms. They live in the food. And they're not, it's not the same as a backyard worm, which lives in the soil and comes to the surface to grab food. And but so it's a special kind of worm that you use. Lubricus rubellus and Encinita 
I can't think of the whole name there, but encinitas is one of the words, are the two varieties that are most common, they're red worms. And so in deciding the size of a bin, you have to decide how much food a week you're gonna put in it. A rule of thumb to get started, and you can adjust it as you go, but a rule of thumb is one and a half pounds of food scraps per square foot per week. And so, and you put that food in a real thin layer um, on top of the, you have a like four or five inches of organic material that the worms kind of hang out in below the food layer. Then you put the food layer on and then you put wet paper on top of that. So that would, the food layer stays wet and moist, but it's a real thin layer. And that's all, where almost all the worms hang out. And that's why if you put too much food in, it starts piling up inches, then it's gonna start going anaerobic because you don't have carbon in there. It's a very nitrogen rich material. You don't have carbon and the microbes go crazy and consume all the air. And then you start anaerobic decay. Um, the wonderful thing about a worm bin is the worms are kind of like a whale on plankton. They come through that food with their mouths wide open. They eat the bacteria and all. So they not only eat the food that's starting to rot, they also control the bacteria in the bin. And that's really important for Okay, now I'm not, <laughs> sorry. Um, it's those worms go through that food with their mouths wide open and they're consuming both the bacteria and the food that's getting soggy, that's starting to rot, that the bacteria is causing that food scraps to start to rot. And they regulate the bacteria population. And that's why worm bins don't go anaerobic. If you took those same food scraps and put them in a box with no worms, they would start stinking to no end in, in a few days. And it's amazing, you can put rotting food that is stinking terribly in a worm bin, as long as you follow that pound and a half per square foot type rule, and, and come back in a week, open the bin up and no smell whatsoever. So the food scraps still might be there, but they have no odor anymore. And the reason is because the worms have been doing their thing. The other thing is they go through it, they bring air in. They make these little tunnels as they tunnel, go around through the food and air comes into the bin. So thinking about your five gallon can, I tend to think maybe your, the thickness of the food scraps might've been inches, several inches, um, but I'm guessing on that. Is that true, my, Martin? It wasn't, it wasn't my experiment, um, but uh, you know we, we lost the, the viability of the living entities and the heat. Um, but I would say that, you know, I, I would not argue with you. It's been a few years now. Um, but I'll add to that question. Um, what about outdoors wintertime? Now the temperature has gone way down. How much uh, variation do you see in the worm's ability to eat? In, in the wintertime, they do slow down some. And I do reduce the volume. Um, as, as I notice, you know, from week to week, I, I, I'm a believer is you feed the worms once a week. And that way, you know how much you're giving them and you're careful in doing it properly. Um, and if you come back and you find there's a lot of food in there, then you cut back a little bit. And they do slow down in the winter because, you know, they're not mammals, they're not warm blooded. <laughs> And so they, everything slows down. However, they do survive at least the cool temperatures we get here. And, and the way they do it is they gather together in one spot in the bin and will roll up in a ball. And sometimes you'll go, where are my worms? And you open one corner and they're all rolled up in a ball. And that's how they maintain their body heat when it does get cold. And that's one of the reasons why the pro production of the bin slows down a little bit in the winter. But you know, now up in the mountains, 
I do think you have to take action in the winter time. If you're getting temperatures in the teens or close to zero for days on end, you have to take action. But definitely here in the Bay Area, and I have a feeling on the valley floor too, your temperatures aren't cold enough where it's a practical problem. If it is, get a hay bale or two. That'll help too. So. Thanks, Dan. I, I would just make a comment to something you said very clearly. Worm bins, compost piles are living entities. And when you have one, you actually have to be thinking of the compost pile or the worm bin as the thing that you are caring for. And um, uh, because it'll, it can die on you if you don't take care of it properly, if it's not properly watered, properly fed, um, and properly housed, uh, you're, you know, it's just like having a, a cat or a dog, it'll die. Um, you can't just stop feeding it for a month while you go to Mazatlan. You just can't, um, uh, you know, forget, you know, not decide you're not gonna water it. And um, because it's literally a living thing, uh, both of them populations um as interested in living as we are uh, in their little communities <laughs> okay yeah, we call com we call compost piles microbial revolutions and and definitely refer to them as ecosystems i love the conversation about worm bins and i used to have worm bin when i lived in the bay area but since i've been living in Merced, I just have a tumbler, and now I'm now I'm wanting to get my, a worm bin back. Um, and to uh, Dee's comment in the chat is a really great one. I, I, connecting children with composting and really having them understand that throwing away is not there's no away, and and this is one way to to close that loop. It's such a good way to do that. Every time I've worked with children and brought worms out, they just everybody just like livens up. It's something tangible they can touch, they can play with it, wiggles, um, even if they're like grossed out by it. Right, it's it's such a a good learning experience. So I agree with her suggestion for Merced County to to do some of that work um, in the in the SB thirteen eighty three. And another point that I wanted to get to SB thirteen eighty three um, to connect Dan, what you brought up about rotting food and odor. Um, I was just looking at like, a, there was like a, a news article in Merced Sunstar or something about SB thirteen eighty three. Just a very short one that says food waste can't go to the landfill. And like the social media comments, I know you should never read those, but they're real comments from people in our community. They were all like, oh no, it's gonna smell. Why, why are we gonna have like piles of rotting food everywhere? So there's this huge disconnect about what even compost is and when it's done well, that it doesn't smell. And I think having demonstrations around the county would be very useful for people to come, breathe that in, touch it, see that a finished compost is safe to handle, that it smells good. That is to say, I mean, there are like environmental justice issues with, with citing large scale compost facilities. So I do wanna, you know, mention that those should be taken into consideration also. But I mean, the process of composting should not be smelly. And so I think that's kind of an education piece that um, that's a really important one to connect people to. Something that that just reminded me. So when I was in high school, it's also part of these these comment, I really think it's so important to teach kids because kids will go home and tell their parents and they themselves will be super interested. Um, I come from Sacramento. Um, I went to a charter school, uh, Sacramento, uh, Sac High. And during my time there, we started a garden and it was so interesting to see like the a lot of people in our community don't know what basic fruits and vegetables were for them to take home and um, take home those fruits and vegetables and teach their families their parents. So whatever we're teaching the kids in school, they will take home, teach their parents. So I think that's like the best way to start um, working towards SB 1383 and compost in general is teaching the students. Um, Cause not only they're easier too, as Rebecca said, they'll be more interested <laughs> and compost and more interested to dig their hands in things. And us older folk sometimes are not as interested and don't have the time. Um, so I think that would be a really good 
um, idea. And I, it's just, it just popped a memory in my head. Like I remember we had a, we had compost bins, we had wooden boxes outside. So I don't really think it's fine. We just, we didn't have money. Um, so they were just pa pallets put together and it was on a pallet. I think the most annoying thing apart about it was we didn't think that we had to rotate it. So every uh, once in a while, we would just shovel it into a new one or like shovel and rotate it to <laughs> get some air in there. Um, but it smelled amazing and people would think like it smelled bad, but I think it also contributes to the fact that we had lavender that would die and we would throw lavender and citrus in there and it would just, it'd be like, this is the best smelling soil I've ever smelled. Um, so there was a question that came in via the registration. It was more of a comment. I'll put it in the chat. Um, it was asking about, they were curious about indigenous ways to compost. So I'd love to learn more about indigenous methods and composting and similar practices. Does anyone know any indigenous practices? So it's a, such a lovely question. Um, uh, you know, some of the strategies that we have right now for composting are the effect of a very wasteful society. So we have accumulation of organic wastes that, uh, or wasted organics that um, we've got to do something with. So I don't necessarily, I don't know if I would say that the same systems of like a compost pile that we see here, I haven't seen that a lot in terms of indigenous practices, but there are uh, lots of really, really cool um, knowledges out there and studies out there that show how uh, indigenous people throughout the world manage their kitchen waste, so their food scraps at smaller scales. Um, and some of that is with burning. So um, we have a whole practice or kind of a, 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 um, a lot of excitement about something called biochar, which essentially are um, organic materials that are thermally decomposed at high temperatures with low oxygen conditions. Um, and so some indigenous practices used fire under those kind of low oxygen conditions to turn uh, food scraps and other organic materials into char. And we see um, that we first learned about this in looking at soils in the Amazon. Um, soils in the Amazon, if you've ever seen soils there, tend to be uh, really red, iron rich, very highly weathered soils. But we see areas where there's these like really deep and black and beautiful nutrient rich soils. And that's attributed to the way that those communities treated their, um, their kitchen scraps and other waste like that. So it's not exactly composting, but certainly in terms of cycling and having closed loop cycles of organic waste materials and putting them back in the soil, we see that all over, um, uh, all over the place throughout human history. Well, there is a technique, I saw a presentation on, I forget what it's called, where you actually build a garden in a circle, and in the center of a circle, you build a compost pile. And it's a, you take the waste from the garden and just take it to the center of the circle. And you have a, they call it keyhole, I think it's called keyhole, because you have to have a walkway to get into the center. And so it kind of looked, the garden looks like a big hole and the key fits in where you walk in and you have this compost pile right in the center. Now I believe that's a technique that has been developed in rural Africa, I think, Northern Africa, if I recall, maybe India. Um, I've never seen it done. I, I, um, it, I don't think you can turn that kind of a compost pile because there's no space to turn it. And so I've just never tried to do it myself, but I've heard of that. The other thing that's being tried in the developing world is you actually take some logs, small logs, and you totally bury them in dirt. And then you try growing stuff on top of that soil. And um, I saw a brief presentation on that too. 
And the idea is, is as the, those logs break down, there are certain kind of microbes that populate that soil around it. Um, I've never, I have no experience with it. I just know that that's another thing that's being tried in the developing world by indigenous people, or maybe it's got a history, I don't know. As, as Rebecca said, we do have two keyhole raised beds in our garden um, and they do amazing. We actually don't have to water them as much. They get enough water. Uh, we grow our squash and watermelons in the raised beds because they do take a significant amount of water, especially here in Merced. And we don't have that problem because of the raised beds. They really retain moisture and nutrients a little bit better than the uh, wooden beds that we have. Thank you. Uh, I want to wrap up quickly just so that we can respect everyone's time, but there is a question that might be easy-ish to answer. I don't know, I'm not the expert. Um, what are some of the quantitative measures of a healthy aerobic compost pile? Specific temperature, oxygen concentration, moisture level. Are these indicators measured in industrial or local composting? And if so, how? I can address that for the home composter, um, I have a thermometer. <laughs> um, that's the only tool I have. But the key is you, the number one thing for a healthy backyard pile now, not a vermicomposting system, but a backyard pile where you're composting food scraps, yard waste, a variety of materials, and you are building that on the soil. You can use a compost bin, open pile, both work. But a key measure of is it working is when you turn that pile. And what I mean by turning it is you tear it down and then rebuild it. A tumbler does that too, but it does it by tumbling the material. And when you do that, you, get, you should get this really healthy odor. The kind of odor you get when you're out in the woods and you turn leaves over, a bunch of leaves under trees, you know that smell? If you're getting that odor, a beneficial odor, I'll call it a perfume, from your compost pile, you've got a healthy pile. And the key thing you really try to do is regulate the carbon-nitrogen ratio. A perfect carbon-nitrogen ratio is 30 to one. And what that really means is if you had a microscope and you broke the materials down to at the atomic level, you would count 30 atoms of carbon for every atom of nitrogen. That's an ideal situation for the microbial life that lives in your pile. Now, obviously we can't measure that, but if you listen to your pile, it tells you what it is. You build the pile, you go in and turn it, you'll see, you'll feel what's going on. Oh, and then the third thing, of course, is you need water like a wrung out sponge. All life forms need water. So if your pile dries out, well, that's the only way I know for you to uh, stop composting is let your pile dry out. Pile, again, nothing's gonna decompose without water. But too much water, then you don't have air. So, you know, you got that wrung out sponge, you got that wonderful odor, and that's how I tell. And maybe I'll just add also at the um, industrial scale, there's a whole set of regulations that compost facilities have to uh, to meet. And so just like you would at your home, uh, your home 
uh, pile. Oxygen, moisture, temperature are all the key factors. Temperature in particular at the industrial scale has to reach a certain level. There's different um, phases of composting, the mesophilic, the thermophilic stage, uh, uh, that temperatures reach high enough to meet the conditions that, um, that create the environment for the microbes that do the composting work and, um, and eliminating any pathogens that might be in that, in that material. Um, so those are all regulated by uh, California has some regulations, but there's also a U.S. Compost Council that has criteria for uh, evaluating what is a mature compost. There's a number of indicators to ensure that the, the compost is mature at the end stage. Right, and the likelihood that you would, you would hit USDA standards in your backyard is zero. <laughs> um, but the likelihood that you can get good soil amendment uh, to put in your uh, in your own soil uh, is very very high, and um, I think that uh, you know anybody who's interested really needs to study some about the history of composting and things like that and understand a little bit um, you know how the modern composting things kind of started out. But um, uh, yes, the. Uh, the only thing I would add to what Dan said is that I have found a 30 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio is impossible to figure out at home because you don't have the chemistry chemicals and chemistry set to do it. But a very good rule of thumb is 50-50, green fresh material and dead brown material. It kind of comes out, especially if the two materials actually are the same material, like dry leaves and green leaves. Um, they kind of work, you just put those in 50-50, it's pretty good. And if you're doing a study, you study about the history of composting and read a lot of websites, you'll run into all these people who got these formulas, like layers of compost. And you put in a, you know, a layer of brown material, six inches, and a layer of this, three inches, and one layer of sandy loam, and one layer of this, and one layer of animal, you know, uh, uh, horse manure, and then it switches to some other type of thing. It goes, and the thing is, is those piles need to be turned within about three days after you make them. And you know what happens when you turn them? You mix all those layers together. What was the purpose of the layers? The purpose of the layers was that, as Dan says, you get the proper proportions of material in the pile. That's the only purpose of the layers. It took me years to realize that in my quest of composting, <laughs> that the only purpose of people talking about layers was that so you initially got the right proportions. And then you just start mixing stuff. And the mixing, as Dan points out, the, 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 uh, the point of mixing is to be able to monitor and modify the moisture and oxygen in the pile. Um, the pocket pile runs low on moisture or low on oxygen, you need to turn it and get moisture and oxygen back in it. Um, uh, I was one of those young people who was born up in the age of the first Star Trek. And so when I started composting about that time, and, and I was fascinated. So um, I came up with this technique of I'd take a broomstick and I'd make, I would be making hot compost piles, the UC method. Um, and I would use a thermometer, but the thermometer I had didn't go, you know, it was, a, it was my mother's turkey thermometer. It didn't go very far into the pile. And so I would take a broomstick, sharpen it up and shove it into the pile. Now the pile was like three by three and four foot of snow fencing holding it up. And so I'd shove that in there, let it sit there for a few minutes, pull it out and what comes out is a hot, you know, is a stick. And as Dan says, you know, there, there's three things that I look for on that stick. Uh, when you, as soon as you pull it out on, a, on any, if it's really working good, it'll be steaming because that pile will be 130, 40, 50 degrees. And you put it up to your nose, steaming. And if it smells like a hot, wet stick and nothing else, it's doing really good. And you grab the stick. And if you can hardly touch it, it's really going along nicely. 
And then the next time you check it, you see whether it's getting cooler or not. Um, but if it smells bad, it doesn't have enough oxygen, you need to turn it. If your stick is on a cooling trend or a drying trend, because it, remember, it should be a hot, wet stick. If the pull it out and that stick is kind of starting to dry out, you need moisture in that pile. And so this is a simple way. Um, and, and, you, and you have to believe the stick because the stick is compostable material. You stick it in the pile, it's going to behave. <laughs> so that, that's a, a little technique that I've used consistently over the years. Yeah, I'll just reaffirm, I forgot to mention. <laughs> we teach in our workshops, okay, so how, you can't measure the carbon-nitrogen ratio. What do you do? You make two piles. One, you say, okay, this is nitrogen-rich material, mostly green in color. The other one, oh, this is carbon-rich material, mostly brown. Basically, mature woody material is carbon-rich. Immature, fast-growing material is nitrogen-rich. And then you do 50... 50, and then you start to listen to your pile and you adjust accordingly. And also the thing about composting that I've seen, it doesn't scale well. You know, at the home level, you can really do a good job without it, without pollutants without environmental consequences with a home compost pile because you're listening to a biological thing and you're interacting with it. As soon as that gets big, like these commercial composters, it becomes a really challenging problem. And I really respect these guys that can pull this off successfully. And this is one of the reasons why home composting is so powerful because you're managing it yourself. Your arm muscle is providing the energy to do the work in the pile. Dan, thank you so much. And, and thank you all for, for the wonderful discussion. I know we're a little bit running over time here, uh, but I wanted to kick it over to Erin to see if she has anything to say or, or if uh, uh, so we can close up and, and let folks uh, continue in, to enjoy this wonderful start to their weekend. Erin? Yeah, thank you. Um, this has been really fascinating. I feel like I learned a lot, but I feel like I also have a lot of questions now too. Um, ever learning, always learning. And there were also quite a few questions we didn't even get to. So it makes me think that there should be a part two or something. If anyone's interested, let me know. Maybe we can do a part two. Anyway, thank you all so much for attending. Um, I will send out the recording to this. Um, in an email afterwards, if you have any ideas for future future panels or AMAs or anything, do let us know. Have a fantastic evening. Thank you, everyone. Take care, everyone.